Greetings to my fellow peace blunderers and welcome to my new video where I'm going to give you a proper practical piece of advice based on one of the positions that I've recently had. And if you just so happen to find this video useful, please like and subscribe. It helps me out massively. Love you. Okay, so in this position, I'm playing the Benoni defense, a very painful opening and often more so for myself than for my opponent. The Bononi almost exclusively brings about close positions, and that's why one of the key moves for black is trying to open up with f5. Whenever you have a close position or a blocked pawn chain, it is natural that you want to attack it from the flank, undermining the center. And whenever this happens as white, you're often encouraged to capture that pawn because if you don't, you might get in trouble. What kind of trouble you might ask? Well, after white castled, I played a move which white shouldn't have allowed by capturing the pot on f5. I played f4. And it doesn't matter really whether it was an open position or a closed position, f4 for black or respectively f5 for white is usually a very scary move. If the f pawn is supported well enough and if g3 has already been played and is now a target, your king side may get picked apart fairly quickly. Now the move I would recommend here for white is knight h2, opening up the bishop, opening up the queen and opening up the rook if I ever capture and they recapture with the pawn. <laughs> now looking at this, bloody hell, that's a lot of arrows. Anyway, in this possession, the opponent did not play knight h2, he played something that I do not particularly like and is very similar to what we saw in the last video with g4. As we saw yesterday, when faced with a bit of tension, the opponent panicked a little bit and pushed the kingside pawn, creating a bunch of weak squares. I decided to utilize that immediately by playing knight h4, double attacking the knight and the bishop, and after knight takes, bishop takes, I literally own the dark squares on white's kingside. Now white, on the other hand, doesn't have anything active to do really on the kingside, so logically he's looking for a counterplay on the queen side, a4. Now a6, stopping knight b5 just in case. Queen d3, not the move that I would play, I would probably play a5, and I think the idea here is just to centralize the queen and let it oversee both sides of the board at the same time. Now if I could somehow get my f pawn on a 3 I would probably win because of how dominant it would be. So I play queen f6 preparing that push. And what we now see in this game is a classic king side versus queen side battle but it's just that white's king side has been quite weakened already so the threats that I create don't yet allow white for counterplay on the queen side they force white to react to them first. And this is what you want to achieve in chess in general you want to create threats of such strength that your opponent doesn't have time to create threats of his own and is forced to passively defend and react to your bishop f3 blocking and now when i have such a great space advantage on the king side i don't need to rush anywhere remember that usually the more space you have the more time you have all i need to do is to slowly improve my position and continue probing for weakness queen g5 pinning the g pawn and preparing to play h5 king h2 escaping the pin and now i still can and Looking back, probably should play h5, but I decided to follow my own philosophy and keep slowly improving my pieces, knight d7. Queen e2, I think it's a very good move. You want to play rook g1, but then the f2 pawn will be hanging, knight f6. Probably not the best move, but I just wanted to get my bishop out. And now white finally catches a break and plays a5, a move that he probably wanted to play for about 5 moves. And here is a very important thing to understand. I just... For the life of me, don't remember who said it, but there's a chess saying, if you're winning on the one side of the board, go and win the other side of the board as well. On the king side, where I'm kind of, sort of, technically winning, I don't see a way to break through, everything is just blocked off. That is why I am now going to try to play bishop d7 and wing on the queen side. I'll try to put my rooks behind my pawns and try to break through. And now white has probably misread my intentions a little bit, he played rook g1, which is kind of irrelevant to what is going to happen on the queen side. Rook fc8, and now comes a very annoying knight a4. It threatens to fork like 5 billion of my pieces and generally speaking knight on b6 is incredibly strong so I just decide to capture it, rook recaptures and now I change my plan a little bit with rook to c1, I'm defending the b7 pawn and preparing to double the rooks on the c file, b3 making the c pawn push more difficult, I double my rooks and the opponent plays rook c4 blocking my c pawn entirely. However I think it's better that he does it with c4 not rook c4 because it would gain him a bit more space. I keep maneuvering my pieces to the queen side with knight d7. The opponent does the same with bishop d2. And now I'm finally breaking through. 
B5. Now the rook is attacked, and after Anpasan, we can see another purpose of knight d7. I can recapture the pawn with the knight on b6. And here comes the critical position of the game. All this time that I've been showing you this position, it has been quite equal. I had some inaccuracies, white had some inaccuracies, sometimes white was slightly better, sometimes I was slightly better. Maybe earlier in the position, I just had this little edge where I could play h5, but I didn't. But it's okay. What is going to happen now, however, lost white the game. And I have a theory about this. I may be talking completely at my ass, but to me it makes sense and I have a bit of evidence to support that. When you play closed positions and when you have closed positions quite often you just generally become a more patient chess player and moving your pieces back and forth trying to gain some slight edge doesn't really bother you psychologically. You are mentally prepared to just play out the most boring game of chess ever played and to wear your opponent down and that is why when the opponent is indeed a little bit worn down they start going for at least some kind of activity the first chance they get and more often than not this is what gets them in trouble. Here, the best move for white is just to retreat the rook to c3 and keep playing this position in a slow and steady manner. The engine says that after rook to c3, it's all zeros. But white just maybe had enough of all of that and went for a tactical complication that eventually killed them with bishop a5. And here's one more thing. When you go for a tactical complication, please calculate through everything and make sure that it works. Otherwise, your honest attempt to make the game more fun will only lose it for you because now after knight takes bishop takes rook takes white doesn't really have good recaptures of the knight if white recaptures with a pawn first of all he messes up his pawn structure a little bit but most importantly he gives me a very strong fast a pawn which i should be able to convert to a win however this is still better than what happened in the game because white retook with the queen and hung his f2 pawn and after that pawn blunder which i think is ultimately a slight lapse of concentration i'm completely winning rook g2 bishop g3 check queen h1 queen h4 and i won the game soon afterward and that is going to be it my favorite unintentional gambiteers let me know your thoughts in the comments don't forget to like and subscribe and and as per usual, may all your chess moves on the board be exclam moves and have an excellent day. Love you guys. See you in the next one.